Hi, and welcome back to Light the Path Podcast. I'm your host, Queen Cole. Make sure you're following Light the Path on all social media platforms. Subscribe so you do not miss an episode. This is a bonus episode of Light the Path, recovering from COVID-19. It's difficult to say where Texas really ranks in recoveries, in part because many states, including most of the country's most populous, California, Florida, and Pennsylvania, do not report the number at all. But what I know for sure is on today's show, I have Michael Lee on the show, and he has recovered from COVID-19. Michael's home state is Arkansas. He attended Mississippi Valley State University and received a bachelor's with honors in the field of criminal justice. While attending, he pledged Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity in the spring of 2006. Michael began his career in law enforcement in 2010, joining the Dallas Police Department in 2013. In 2019, Michael launched his nonprofit, I Am Black and Blue. You have to stay tuned. You don't want to miss this episode. So thank you so much for being on Light the Path today, sharing your story um, about what's going on. I didn't think that, uh, just say when I started this podcast, November 2019, you know, I was all looking forward to 2020. I don't think that in June I would be saying COVID-19, pandemic, uh, these kind of words. So I just, I'm in awe, but I am thankful that you have recovered from all that. And I just want to talk a little bit about your story, how it all happened. And then ultimately, I do want to talk about most importantly is your nonprofit. So definitely, first of all, welcome. And how are you doing right now? Great. I'm doing great. Matter of fact, uh, I'm doing a 30 mile uh, challenge with some group of people around Dallas. So I'm back to running. So I'm, I'm, I'm back to 100%. Okay, okay. And then how long did that take to get back to 100%? So I, I would say maybe two to three weeks after because uh, I would say maybe um, a week after going initially going back to work, I said, well, let me see uh, how my lungs truly are. Uh, because, you know, that, that that is the really big thing with COVID is the upper respiratory uh, how it's affected and the coughing, uh, because the doctors would say, "Hey, uh, Mr. Lee, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not gonna lie to you. When you cough, uh, it's really doing some damage to your lungs. And your lungs gonna have to repair themselves over time." I was like, "Okay." I was like, "All right, we'll see how it goes." Because I, I've I've had uh, pneumonia before, I've had a uh, flu before, so I'm like, "Okay." So I, I tried running, uh, and it was like a complete different type of running like i couldn't run the long distance that i normally could and it was uh really impacting um to the point where i had to actually have to stop i had to literally stop midway through my normal run and had to walk back home uh, mm-hmm. because that haven't repaired themselves but over time the more and more i kept expanding the more and more i kept running the more and more i kept exercising i basically got back to uh, my normal uh, ability to run the type of miles I like to run. So, so what happened to prompt you to get tested? So, um, all of a sudden, I was at work, and me and my partner that I work with we went to lunch, and <laughs> out of nowhere, I started coughing. And I mean, I was like, "Wait a minute!" And it was a, uh, it was just out of the blue, just a hard, hard cough. I'm mm-hmm. like. Um, and so I said, okay, well, maybe just allergies. I do suffer from allergies like everybody else. Um, so as the weekend went by, I was fine. And that Tuesday when I was getting ready, getting dressed to go to work, all of a sudden I'm just sweating. I mean, I'm just boiling. I'm like, am I hot? Maybe you think I'm, maybe I just got out the shower, putting on my vest, my body on, maybe I'm just, just hot. But all of a sudden I felt weak as well. And then I said, well, you know what? I said, well, we have a big thing at work um, saying, if you do feel sick, don't come. And I said, you know what? I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to go. Uh, so I said, uh, we have another email basically says, Hey, they do in-home testing for the flu to make sure, uh, see if you have the flu. So I had a uh, nurse uh, come to my apartment and test me for flu A and flu B said I was negative for both, but I had a fever. 
And um, the nurse said, hey, I think you should really go get um, checked out, get tested. And I was like, okay. And actually, I, I thought I felt pretty decent. I, I, you know, I had a little little temperature, a little bit, felt a little off, but I, I just think, hey, maybe it's just it's allergy season. So I went and got tested, and then that's when I got the results. Mm, okay. So do you think there's a point where, I mean, because you're an officer, you're around the community all the time, you're here, there, is there a way that you can pinpoint, like, I could have got the virus here? No, honestly, because... I'm literally, I thought, like, I made, because I, I documented on my on my nonprofit and on my personal Facebook page, I documented my whole process. And I, I even backtracked and think, like, I was washing my hands, I was using Germix, but I can't remember. There were times where, you know, you forget and accidentally touch your face or um, uh, you may rub your eyes. And another guy who worked down the hallway from me, actually, I didn't know, he was the first officer. So he could have maybe used the restroom and I came in behind him and touched the door and touched my face or eyes or something before washing my hands. Who knows? Because he, we did have an officer who was uh, tested positive who worked right down the hallway first. So. Okay. Okay. And, you know, I was thinking about that because I was like, you know, you say you get a fever, a mouth fever, or say you don't get a fever. You just cough it in, like you said, allergies. I suffer with allergies and I never suffered allergies until I moved to Texas. Like. Yeah. I was 30 plus years old and all of a sudden, like my eyes are watery. I like to run outside as well. So, you know, when my apartment complex is doing landscaping or anything like that, like my eyes are itchy and my nose is sort of a little, you know, drippy. And I'm like, this has never happened to I got the Texas. So, you know, hearing that these, I mean, the mild symptoms, I know, you know, they expand, but somebody like me, I would be like, okay, I'm going <laughs> to go to work. But with you not being able to go to work, that really uh, was a telltale sign, especially for men, because y'all go to work. Yeah. <laughs> y'all go to work. We do. Because you always talk to, to be the tough guy. You know, my mom always told me, you know, you sometimes you just got to push through, baby. I know you don't feel good, but you got to push through. But I knew it was the chance of it, and I couldn't risk uh, that chance. Um, I didn't want to have that on my conscience to know that um, people in the office have kids. I don't have any kids. I have, it's, it's a couple, uh, one of my partners, he just adopted three kids. Um, so I, I didn't want to take that risk. I couldn't go to work and get someone else sick and have that on my conscience and know that, you know, I brought that to the office. So I was like, you know what? I'd rather just take the time off uh, and just see if it's the, if it's the flu. I, I, I honestly, I wanted it to be the flu. I was like, hey, I hope it's the flu. Then it's cool. But uh, it wasn't. So I didn't want to take that risk at all. Well, that was good. And I've had the flu one time in life and I never wanted again. I said, I don't know where this flu stuff came from, but I never want to get the flu again. I don't even want to touch COVID. I don't want to have nothing to do with it. How did you tell your family? And then did you quarantine alone? How did that go? Yes, I told uh, told my mom, I called, uh, because I, I told her the process. I said, when I started feeling bad, I let her know. And um, yeah, I, and I did. I quarantined alone because when I when I already had the days off, I was just taking the weekend off. Uh, when I started feeling bad, I quarantined immediately. Um, I let someone have my dog for a little bit uh, because I didn't know. I heard about you can maybe uh, transfer to your dog, your pets. So I was like... Let me let me get let my dog go go leave the house so she don't catch it or something crazy like that. Mm -hmm. um, I knew I had to um, take evasive action basically because I, I my biggest thing was I did not want to if I did have it which I did I didn't want to give it to one else. Um, yeah, and that's good and that's how we all are. You know, you don't want your family members to go through. You know, whatever. Like if my kids ever got sick, I'm like. I wish I could take it from you. You know what I mean? So I understand that, what you're not saying. You know, I don't want to get other people sick or anything like that. How long were you sick and what medication did you take? So I was sick from what was it? Um, March 13th or well, March 19th until uh, basically the end of that month, the entire month. Uh, it took me to basically get better. Um and medication, now that's the thing about it. I, this is before I knew about the whole not taking ibuprofen. Uh, I was taking ibuprofen to try to lower my fever. 
uh, that was the worst. I, I told my mom uh, that was night two. It was so bad uh, because okay, basically with COVID, it feels like you're drowning sitting up. Like I would sit like this and it literally feels like someone is smothering you. It feels like your lung capacity is the size of a dime. So you would, I would sit here and I would have to just kind of come, calm myself down, kind of relax. And, um, and then I would just try to sit up and then I was to take the ibuprofen. Found out that the ibuprofen was something that made it worse because um, I was taking it so, and I, it, it made me feel so bad. I thought I was, I thought I was gonna die, honestly. Uh, I took an envelope, me being a cop for 10 years, I already know if I go out, I don't want people to have to look for stuff. I literally took my wallet, my birth certificate, driver's license, I wrote down my ATM uh, password and I put it in a manila folder and I left it in the front door. Um, because I, I could not catch my breath. And I was like, I, mean, I could, could catch it. And I didn't want to dial 911. I was like, you know, trying to be the tough man, you know, uh, trying to push through it. But it was times where I would wake up because it felt like someone was drowning me while I was sleeping. Uh, it threw wow. me off. I mean, it, like I said, I've had pneumonia and the flu, and it was 10 times worse um, than both of those. And that's the scary part also that scares me because you were alone. You know, me being a woman, being a nurturer, like I want to be there for whoever, like, I don't know. I don't even want to say like, I don't want to say anybody close to me right now, but my great, great uncle's uncle, 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 uncle. <laughs> okay. If he was sick, I would want to, you know what I mean? Like you want to be there. I mean, even when you hear about people going to the hospital or the restaurant, like they're alone. Yes, they can Skype in or Zoom in or, you know, FaceTime or whatever, but it's different than the human touch being there. You know, when, when you're sick, you don't feel good. And then you're saying you felt like you were drowning. You're waking up by yourself alone. Like, I can't imagine it. Like, that That sounds like terror. This sounds like a, a horror story to me. It's and, and it's, it's the mental aspect of it as well. It was a tough... Uh mental challenge as well because like i said you would you were thinking to yourself like look i'm a person that you know i believe in high uh, a higher power and you're like look i'm not going out this way <laughs> you know I'm, I'm gonna push through i'm praying to get through this but like you said you you want someone to be around you but at the same time you don't because you like i could not i wouldn't give this to my worst enemy so i i, I don't sure don't want to give it to someone i care about yeah. and so waking up like i said it, i calculated it was about 400 plus hours alone um, wow! by myself, and so you you take that the the isolation plus the fear of like don't know if you're gonna wake up tomorrow, and you jumble those up, and it's a it's a so it's, it's a mental battle. Like I said, it's a tough situation because you have some people who ha have it who have zero symptoms, and you have people who have it who have like my type symptoms, and then you have another group of people who have it who's way worse than what I had, and so that's. That, that's the mental aspect of it that um, that was really rough. But like far as medicine, it didn't take any medicine. I found out some different um, steam vapors that you do. So I did like um, um, orange peels, onion, garlic, and salt, and I boiled it in a pot. And I would use that to help me breathe. And I learned it really did help uh, help me breathe because it was like uh, my chest was so congested, like just nose, chest. It was just so much congestion, and that the, that that steam pot um, that I saw—I forgot what website I saw it on—but I did it, and it really did help. Because at nighttime, I don't know if the air is thinner at night or what, but it was so hard to breathe that I, I literally had to do that almost every other night to try um, to help me breathe. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's a, a scary thing and good thing that you were praying and really had a good strong mindset. I mean, because. You know, people suffer with depression and anxiety and to have that and then have to deal with it alone is is a really, really a mental fight. So I'm thankful that you got through all that. Are you afraid of getting the virus again? Um, No, I, I being a cop, I just don't live in fear. Uh, fear can destroy you. Fear keeps you alive. But just living in fear. No, I'm just, I still do the same uh, precautions, still wash my hands, um, I wear masks. Uh, you hear the CDC say, no, you can't uh, You can't catch that strand again. Um, so it's like your body builds up these antibodies and whatever. whatever. 
Um, but I still just I, I take the precaution. I'm still I wash my hand. You know, yeah, I just touch my face again. I, I'm still trying to do what normal people or everyday people are doing. Um, but no, I'm not really. It's like saying, you know, I can't live that way. <laughs> you know, I just can't live that way. Well, that's good. Well, that's good. Well, I am thankful that you are recovered. You're doing well because now we need to talk about the other things that you have going on. I want to talk about your nonprofit. Tell everybody about that. And what was your inspiration for starting that? Okay. So um, my nonprofit is called I Am Black and Blue. Um, we all know people of color have had a very long, 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 long history uh, of negativity um, of law enforcement from things that it was used from slave time to Rodney King to uh, currently things that we're seeing in the news now. And me being a black man, I'm right on the, f the fence of it. I see uh, why people are so angry at what's going on in law enforcement, but at the same time being a cop, I know there's underlying issues where you have a person screaming at a protest like, oh, you know, Black Lives Matter. And you, you look at him like, I know that guy, he broke into an old lady house, but you're screaming Black Lives Matter. And so I was like, I have to find something that I could help do my part because I know eight hours a day wasn't giving me what I needed um, as a personal, as a black man to try to help this. I don't have any kids, but I have a niece, I have a nephew. I know I have to do my part if I want to make this world better for them. It may not be in my generation or my time, but the, the work I do now, may help them down the line. So I am black and blue. Um, I deal with, uh, I, I used to say I deal with a certain particular issue. No, I'm a, I'm, I'm just, I have a big circle from mental health uh, for African-American youth. Um, it, I'm not into studies. I don't do numbers. I do factual things. I see this every day in the street. If you look at some of the young black men who are committing crimes, look and see what their father did or their grandfather did or their uncle did. They may have seen some traumatic incidents. Um, I, so I've, I've had protests and when I did myself that was, I was interviewed where I had um, people who came to talk to juveniles who've been victims or had family members of victim of crime. Um, I'm Black and Blue, we deal with educating uh, young men of color on traffic stops, how to handle uh, a traffic stop, even if that cop comes off to you as a total, you know, butthole, and which I tell people, you have those, you have bad cops, you have bad dentists, doctors, you have bad everything in every profession, but it's way of surviving that traffic stop that doesn't belittle you as a man, but you survive the traffic stop. So if you feel free, if you want to make that complaint, you can, but you survive it with dignity to make that complaint. Okay. And then what about, is there any kind of training also? Well, not training, I guess any kind of, I know we edu try to educate one way, but what about going the other way? Are there any kind of things where police officers have some kind of training dealing with diverse communities if they're not necessarily from that community? So the, we do at uh, at the Dallas Police Department, we do have that diverse diversity training. Um, I'm actually, before all this started, I was trying to put my card in to be a diversity instructor. Um, you do have it, but I, I like I tell people, I, I want people to understand um, as a people of color and as men of color, we have to do our part as well. Uh, I don't know if people should know that this profession is a predominantly white male profession. And what happens is that these young men are from all parts, walks of the world, and maybe or maybe not uh, have had conversations with people of color. And only thing they have seen is what they've seen on this little screen and the television. Mm -hmm. And I said, we of color, we have to stop allowing people to portray our image on, on this television and this social media. Because if you was honestly, have never spoke to a person of color and all you did was look on social media, social media and TV portrays us as wild animals. We're fighting, we're cussing, we're, we're doing all this. If you look at you, you look at a young black man who, who given the community or doing a fundraiser, yeah, he may have a million views or a thousand views, but you have somebody fighting over Popeye's chicken sandwich, it's got, 15, 500 million views. It's shared right. 600 million times. But you would share ignorance, but you won't share this, this black man doing charity for these kids. We as a people have to stop allowing uh, this screen to portray us in that way. 
Uh, and teaching officers, yes, that like we do have diversity training, and I am trying to put my card in to be a diversity uh, instructor because um, you have younger officers now. Uh, it's it's harder to find people who have life experience to be officers. Nobody wants to be an officer right now, sadly to say, because of the trend that you get. You know, y'all killers, y'all this, y'all that. Um, so it's a really fine tooth, and so you're getting a lot of younger guys. Uh, who haven't had that uh, life experience and you tell them, oh, I want to be a, a real cop. And sadly to say, being a real cop to some of them means working in the worst area. And sadly to say, some of the worst areas where you get the most violent crime are your minority areas. So yeah. you're a white officer who hasn't been around people of color, who wants to who wants to be or feel like a big cop or really cop, where, where, where can he work now to feel or to get that type of experience? He has to go now work in the minority areas. And then you wonder why there's such a like, oh, this white officer killed this black man because they're only white officers working in their area uh, because they outnumber us. It's a small percentage of, of black males who work in law enforcement. I have details, but it's uh, 15 people in the detail. It's two blacks or one black male. Yeah. And I noticed that, I mean, with my generation, you know, we grew up saying, you know, we want to be a firefighter or we want to be a cop. I remember, um, I mean, obviously umpteen years ago going uh, on a field trip, we went down to the city jail and they, you know, let us go into the jail telling us all about, you know, not because I, I lived in Cleveland, Ohio. So this was a very, you know, minority driven rough kind of I'm from the hood <laughs> and so um we I remember going down to the police station the city police station and they locking us in you know showing us like you don't want to be here and all this that and really you know some of the boys from the class saying you know what I want to be a police officer I want to be able to help like people um back then would call, you know would call call the police for help like I would think you know, for help. I mean, nowadays it's like people are very afraid of police officers. So what you're doing, I really like that. How can people get involved and uh, volunteer or maybe help out? What can the community do to help you with your nonprofit? So I have a, a website. Uh, I am, if you Google, I am black, uh, the, the letter I, or the letters I am B L K the letter N and blue spelled out. Um, I have a, a platform, well, a, a website, which if you have, um, if you want me to come speak at a school or I have other guys who work with me, if you want us to come talk to you at your school, when, when the school opens back up, um, different venues, or if you got issues, uh, all my programs and training that I do comes out of my pocket. I don't charge anything. I'm not in this for money. I'm in this to make a true difference. So if you go to IamBlackAndBlue.com and my Instagram is IamBlackAndBlue as well. You can see all the questions, all the, the different things I've done so far. I've done a panel. Um, my very first panel, I had uh, four other officers of color and, and I invited the public to come. I had food, I had drinks, and basically where you could ask us real questions because uh, me and my partner, we've been this last year we've been in a lot of tough situations. Uh, we were the two officers in the Botham John case. I don't know if, if you saw the body cam. Mm -hmm. That's my body cam of me doing, me and my partner doing CPR. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. So you know that we, we've had a lot. And like I said, even with that situation, uh, we have insight for people to like to, to inform people like here I am, me and my partner, two African-American males trying to help another black male who was 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 shot in his home. And we getting people, you know, send us messages like, oh, y'all Uncle Tom, y'all lying, y'all doing all this knowing we gave our bets to save this young black man life and because people don't know us they just see this blue uniform and pray like oh i was born in this blue i tell people i've been in blue uniform for 10 years but i've been black all my life uh so don't get it twisted and but it's amazing how people treat you so but i don't care about that because my goal is to show you in action you could you could talk all you want to like i tell people uh even with the uh brother my who just killed you could do all this talking and, and texting and social media. Good. Get it out there. But what are you doing? Are you going to your people who, who make these laws and look at some of these laws, all these self-defense laws, these stand your ground laws, and see does these laws apply to you? Um, I ask, I ask um, I, when the world opens back up again, 
I want to start, a, I'm going to start a program. Basically, I want people to come out and meet the officers that works in your area. Um, know these people because you continue, we continue to build this, this gap between us. Then when some habit is like, oh, I don't trust you. It's because we don't know each other. Yeah. Uh, policing is, is my title. I'm what they call neighborhood police officer. My job every day is to go out to the public to answer your personal question. You can literally call my office and, and I will come to your house and talk to you personally. Personally, I'm a face of one of the faces of the departments, but it's just that. And like I said, black and blue, it's uh, just a wide range of, <laughs> of different things. I used to say, oh, yes, yeah, just it's just this. But no, it's from mental health to education, to teaching, to speak, speaking, to lectures, to videos, to to volunteer work. You name it, I'm there. OK, I love that. I think it's a great platform to be on. I definitely want to get involved. We st we can stay connected and I will put all your information in the show notes so that way people can also contact you, reach out to you, follow you on social. So that way when everything, whenever that happens, we can all get together and really uh, make real differences and real strides. And I think that's important. It's one thing because um, I'm a big uh fan of vision boards, but I say it's your action board. Like you can make a pretty board, yeah. but if you don't put any action with it, nothing's going to happen. So I like that you're putting what you're doing in action and you're, you're living it. So that's the most important part. How can you encourage everyone? I mean, like you said, even with the climate, um, not that we don't have enough to think about. Now we have other things going on just to bridge the gap between law enforcement and community. Um, I, I would say um, it's a knowing that you have something um, precious, like a child. No, no mother wants to get that call saying uh, that your child was was killed in a law enforcement incident. Could imagine that type of feeling. Um, so I encourage people because I know they think, well, that's not happening to me. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not happening right now, but who knows what's happening down the line or who knows what happens if one hour or 10 minutes of you saying, you know what, let me take my son up to this police station. Let me, who, who works in, I stay in this area. I looked it up. I stay, I stay in the uh, beat 150. I would like to meet the, the, uh, the beat officers for 150. Why man? Because this is my son. Uh, you know, like the mom, and I tell moms, fathers, take your son up there and let them meet these officers. Because who's to say your son comes home one day? Ah, oh, I forgot my keys. He want, He's like, well, you know, my back window always open. Just then, that officer sees him jump to the window. But that officer comes out. He's that beat officer. He's like, oh, you, 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 Mr. Lee's son. Oh, okay. But and just like that, it could have turned bad. Could have been a deadly force situation. Who knows? But I want encourage you because I know it's not happening to you right now, but it may something down the line may happen where um, you really want that that one on one connection. I, I, I will give the cheat code officers. When we know you, we're less likely to to go a, a, a south route. If we know you're like, oh, that's that's such and such. Let me let me let me take him to his mama. I know he, he's a good he's a good kid. He out here tripping, you know. I'm gonna take him to his mama house so she can she deal with him instead of taking him to jail. Um, cities have got so big and, and we've got so distant, but police officers, I, I remember growing up and I grew up in a small town where they, they would know like, oh, that's that's such and such boy, that's such and such son, that's such and such. So if you saw them out doing something they weren't supposed to be doing, you could handle it accordingly and it's not always handled it in jail time. Jail has come so like a norm in the minority community, like, oh yeah, I just go to jail, or I just did like jail. What? No. I think now it's one out of four black men go to have been to jail, or one out of three has been to jails in some form or fashion. That's yeah. well. Thank you for taking the time to be on Like the Path, sharing your story, sharing your nonprofit. I can't wait to hear about all the other things. We'll have to definitely connect when you have things going on to be able to come out, support, um, and definitely hear more from you. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. Make sure you're following Light the Path on all social media platforms. Subscribe so you do not miss an episode.